Audiobook Richard Stratton Part 2 Crawling The Demon Although the origins of the American Pit Bull Terrier are shrouded in the mists of time, my personal speculations are reinforced whenever I take Judo out of its chain. Despite normally being a calm dog, Judo has a real passion for fighting, and for this reason, when he is released from the chain for any reason, usually for a walk, he will throw himself at any dogs barking at them. This, in turn, encourages other dogs to go absolutely nuts trying to catch him. In the course of the tumult, I can detect two or three voices, including Judo's. For those who haven't heard the low bark of a hunting hound on the trail, why is it different from barking in kennels, their voices carry an almost agonizing ecstasy and longing. Judo's voice will never be mistaken for that of the famous Bugleman, but it nevertheless has the same urgency and delicious delirium as that of the hounds. Now, lest the reader jump to conclusions, I am not saying that pit bulls and hounds are common descendants, perhaps thousands of years ago. Who knows when mankind and canines first acted together in hunting? But it must have been thousands of years ago, and this was probably the first practical activity of dogs used by mankind. Hunting was serious business then, but undoubtedly most men enjoyed the hunt too, and the dogs who also enjoyed it and excelled in it were perpetuated. We are assuming, of course, that mankind knew nothing about selective breeding in those days, but it is easy to imagine how the less enthusiastic and less able dogs could not participate in the hunting raids and, perhaps, were driven away or killed. This would be an indirect selective breeding separating the less profitable animals. Dogs assisted in hunting by helping to track game, then bring it down, and finally kill it. Eventually, specialization evolved. Thus, dogs with longer muzzles and drooping lips were better on the trails. The long-legged, slender-bodied dogs were faster than the others, and they were more adept at bringing down game once spotted. The strong, Powerful dogs that were most useful in the kill were not as fast but were nevertheless necessary once the game had been brought down. In this way, both man and canine have developed an appetite for hunting. With the advent of farming and technology, hunting was no longer necessary and became recreational or a sport. Not all men or all dogs, for that reason, were any longer allowed to hunt. True hounds were kept in kennels or on chains when not hunting with their owners so they wouldn't bleed the game or attack the domestic livestock. Stray dogs caught hunting were killed, and so were the men. Men were called invaders if they hunted but were not part of the people of the land, and the penalty for trespassing was often death. There was a time when it was illegal for peasants to even own a hound, because what else would they want one for if not for hunting, or, better, poaching? However, peasants were allowed to keep small dogs which were used to repress nuisance animals such as rats, moles, and badgers, and the dogs that did this were called terriers. Unfortunately for peasants, bulldogs were generally thought of as hunters, and peasant ownership of them was prohibited. It is possible, even probable, that many of the small bulldogs were masked as a terrier so that their owners could keep them. This must be the origin of the name, Pit Terrier, that the Irish often used for their dogs, while everyone else referred to them as bulldogs. And there, too, may be a clue as to why Irish pit dogs were so small. Be that as it may, it's easy to imagine how sports were developed by the use of these three types of hounds and terriers. It's easy to see how hunters became interested in which dog was the fastest, and thus the dog race was born. Various tracking tests evolved for track dogs and are still used today. And it's not hard to see how curiosity developed about which was the most formidable of the killer dogs. In my opinion, 
Dog-on-dog -dog fighting originated much earlier in history than most people think. To demonstrate the dog's efficient hunting connection, captive bears and bulls were used by what came to be called baiting bears and bulls. Butchers later used these dogs to hold a bull chosen for slaughter. This practice, along with goading the bull, apparently solidified the breed with the bulldog name. Prior to this they were known, in several languages, as wild boar hunters, bear biters, bull biters, mastiffs, and banished, confined, dogs. Meanwhile the peasants, too, had their hobby with their terriers. So we hear about badger baiting, or pulling, and rat killing competition. Since many peasants had a bulldog, and bulldog crossbreed, disguised as a terrier, it is strongly suspected that the poor, too, indulged in dog fights. While people in general were interested in dogs for what they could do, they also appreciated a good looking dog, one who was also good at his dexterity. A devotee's concept of beauty was closely related to function, so the perception of good looks tended to depend on the type of activity in which the dog was involved. One of the first groups to develop conformation patterns was the bloodhound people, and they started showing their dogs, too. So there were now two categories, sporting dogs and non-sporting dogs, which meant hunting dogs for the first category and, the rest, fighting for the second. This system is still used today in American Kennel Club conformation shows, except that other categories have been added. Thus, we have divisions such as the toy group for lapdog sets, working dogs for dogs that do farm work or guard work and anything else that can be referred to as work, and the hound group which includes scent and vision which was developed for people who thought hunting dogs were special enough to be in their own category. The system had its flaws, of course. One problem was that some breeds would fit into more than one category. Our own breed, for example, would be a hunting dog, or hound, a working dog, like a catching or guard dog, and even a terrier, as it was used for rat and badger killing. Just to mention two examples, the dachshund was mistakenly placed in the hound group, apparently because the classifiers thought that hund, dog in German, was translated to hound when it was actually dog. The Boston Terrier is placed in the non-sporting category, and I think that is as good a place as any since the breed is certainly not a terrier. But then, why the designation terrier? The flaws in the system resulted from a combination of ignorance on the part of the people who employ the system and the resistance of many races being classified under a single category. However, the system has worked well for exhibitions for many years. The sad part is that the public is only informed about dog shows and has gotten its information about dogs, directly or indirectly, from American Kennel Club sources. In this way, misjudgment and fanciful ideas about dogs abound, because the pent-up capital of exhibitors has been the adoption of ridiculous and unsubstantiated stories about their breeds and the treatment of unregistered breeds with the American Kennel Club as if they did not exist. As someone who has tried to delve into the history of our race, I can figure how easily misconceptions can be solidified into the official history of a race. Fortunately, I have the advantage of seeing whatever historical evidence is available from the point of view of being familiar with the pit bull in almost all its aspects, arena dog, captive dog, hunting dog, guard dog, domestic dog, and so on. However, any student of any race should maintain a skeptical attitude toward all aspects of any race history, including this one because the histories are gathered from various personal contacts, other writings, which must have been borrowed from even other scripts, illustrative work, old documents, and ancient artifacts. I get very upset with these stories that purport to trace a specific race back to the ancient Egyptians. And yet, 
I can look at artifacts, or their photographs, from that time and see dogs that look a lot like ours and were used as ours perhaps were, too. However, I will never try to say that these dogs were our breed, Egyptian pit bull terriers, although I think it is perfectly logical to think that our dogs are descended from this type of dog. But going back to more modern times, we have no way of knowing when the first imports of pit bulldogs were made, but my guess will be that they came with the infamous ones who were threatening all of Europe with civil war and who either escaped or were brought here. This would have been before 1776, but of course this is pure speculation. We know from photographs that the dogs were here before the civil war, and, of course, the imports which were so crowded with the Irish migrations resulting from the potato famine of 1845 to 1851 are well known. In fact, what really happened was that one of the few Irish people who became immediately economically successful in this country at that time either returned to their homeland and brought back the pit terriers, or they were sent by their family members who still lived there. The pit bulldog has always had an appeal to minorities, and I'm not quite sure why. More likely, the oppression and hard work is more bearable when you have a dog in your house who you know can beat every other dog in town. Fascination with the fighting dog can be almost pathological in its intensity, but it can also be a balm for the wounds and outrages suffered by an unjust society. Anyway, since we know that pit bulldogs existed in several countries, it seems that other immigrants were instrumental in bringing dogs of their favorite breeds and from several countries. The population was concentrated in the New England, New England, areas, so, at least in the beginning, dogs were mainly found there, too. But pit bull owners are individualistic adventurers, the kind who would venture out into an unpopulated wilderness. In this way, the race moved to the south and west. The breed continued to be, and is to this day, used for a myriad of activities including fighting and hunting and as hunting dogs, but of course the vast majority of people keep dogs as pets or guard dogs. Pet owners typically knew arena dog owners or at least arena dog breeders and were often studious of the breed aspect. In other words, things were much more than they are today. From each information, indications are that the breed was simply called bulldog by enthusiasts. However, when Chauncey Z. Bennett created the United Kennel Club in 1898, he recognized the breeds as American Pit Bull Terriers. The word American helped to distinguish the breed from the show Bull Terrier that was often referred to as the English Bull Terrier. However, Bennett had a definite preference for using the word American to name his race. Thus, he had an American Fox Terrier and a hunter of a type of raccoon from the United States and an Old Glory Black and Tan, and later, the Spitz, long-nosed dog breed, became became the American Eskimo. For a while, he also registered white colice as colice colombianos. Colombia was another word used for America that was more common in the old days, as in the song, Colombia, Gem of the Ocean, Bennett wasn't necessarily an ultranationalist but people thought ours was one special country, and they thus accepted anything new or dubious if it had American in front. Bennett's reasoning was that if a race was developed or changed slightly in this country, then it could be called American. For a long time afterwards, there was debate over whether the breed should be called Pit Bull Terrier, to emphasize the acceptance of arena dogs or American Bull Terrier to promote the breed. American Pit Bull Terrier with the Pit in parentheses was Bennett's solution. When the American Kennel Club was petitioned to recognize the breed around 1935, the name American Pit Bull Terrier or American Bull Terrier could be used because of the influence of Bull Terrier owners who felt they should have a patent on the name. 
Bull Terrier Boston Terrier owners who wanted Bull Terrier Boston recognition were turned down for the same reason. A further factor was that the AKC American Kennel Club did not want to use a name that had been used by the UKC. United Kennel Club Will Judy, who promoted and edited Mundo du Chao, Dog World, at the time, suggested the name Terrier Yankee. Anyway, Staffordshire Terrier was the decided name, and the breed was placed in the Terrier group, which is a strangely inappropriate place. The English version of their arena dog was recognized by the British Kennel Club as the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, apparently the Bull Terrier breeders there were more reasonable or less influential. For many years, people considered the Staffordshire Terrier, Staff or Staff, and the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, Stafford, to be the same breed, even though they developed entirely different bloodlines together and had different standards. Among exhibitors, there has always been a fascination with imported lineage. Thus, in the 1950s, some staff owners imported Staffordshire Bull Terriers and crossed them with their staffs. Well, this certainly caused a civil war within staff circle, as many of them would not accept Staffords as being the same race. Howard Hadley, one of staff's most respected and influential owners, led a successful fight to get the Staffordshire Bull Terrier declared a separate breed by the AKC. A problem then arose because the registry had two breeds with very similar names, the Staffordshire Terrier and the Staffordshire Bull Terrier. At this point, staff's owners, who fought so hard over the name American Bull Terrier so long ago, were offered to have the name withdrawn, but they declined. The reason was that they had spent over 20 years and thousands of dollars promoting the name Staffordshire, and they were now reluctant to give up. This didn't make any sense, of course, because the staff never became popular, and most people had no idea what they were. In any case, the name American Staffordshire Terrier was chosen as a compromise and, last I heard, it is still the name being used. In the meantime, a registry office to exclusively register pit bulldogs was founded by Guy McCord in Chicago. He was called the American Dog Breeders Association, and he registered the breed as Pit Bull Terriers. Later the office was taken over by Frank Ferris who had married the widow of John P. Colby. In the 1970s, the registry office was acquired by the Greenwood family, and at this time, the American Pit Bull Terrier, without the parentheses, was the official name for the breed from the ADBA, American Dog Breeders Association. Under Ralph Greenwood's direction, the registry office grew tremendously in size and influence. Prior to this, the ADBA was simply that other organization that registers pit bulls. The pit bull's popularity waxed and waned like all breeds, but it was always less popular than the breeds at the height of showing because it was so much less exposed than the others. Another obstacle was that in the old days, people who kept dogs as pets let them loose, as it was considered cruel to confine them. A pit bull, however, had to be confined, penned, kenneled, or chained, definitely inconvenient in those days. However, the breed kept adherence among the general public, although it was not a large group. I remember Bob Wallace once complaining about how people would ask him if one of his prized pit bulls he was walking was part boxer. Well, one of the reasons Bob was so furious was that boxers were a relatively new breed to him, after all, they only became popular in this country after World War II, while the pit bull was the formidable old breed. For Bob. But I bet Bob would love to go back to the days when race was virtually a secret rather than an unofficial scapegoat for the humanists. Aside from being kept as pets and guard dogs, the dogs were also used as hunting dogs, usually as silent stalkers, 
but occasionally, but very rarely, the pit bull would bark on the trail, pedigree dogs, usually as captive dogs, but a surprising number as all-round dogs on farms, and of course as arena dogs. Activity in the arena was much more exuberant in every district of the country, but each district lived in a world of its own. A trade magazine, such as Dog Fancy, Dog Breeders, Pit and Pal, or Pit Dogs, would occasionally prosper or eventually go out of print. The Bloodlines Journal, published by the United Kennel Club, was a constant source of information, but it contained fight reports only from the southern arenas. Action, photographs of dogs in close quarters appeared very rarely in this magazine, and during the 1950s, reporting stopped altogether. A variety of rules were used for competitions, see Appendix A, but in the 1950s, Gabon Trahan and Floyd Burroughs teamed up to write what became known as the Cajun Rules. Similar rules were written by Al Brown, but they were not widely used. In fact there is a rumor that some winners in the West made new rules, calling them Cajun Rules, thinking they might be better accepted that way, and sent them out to various key men. There were three main strokes in the Cajun rules, namely, 1. Emphasis was placed on the trainer's hands being positioned in front of the shoulders, of the dog ready to scratch, 2. A turn was more liberally defined as a turning dog simply turning his head and shoulders away from his opponent without regard to whether or not it was a loss of interest in the fight, even a maneuver that resulted in the momentary turn of head and shoulders. Shoulders was called a turn, 3, an off-hold count ranging from 10 seconds to 2 minutes, could start with one scratch at a time, and the losing dog to start. The biggest impact of the Cajun rules was to shorten competitions and thereby greatly increase the chances of preventing the loss of one of the dog's lives. In the early 1950s, IQ. Kennedy founded a magazine called Pit Dogs. It caused a general uproar among pit bull breeders in general, while the Bloodlines Journal became more and more timid in supporting the breed and almost never mentioned the fights. Now, here was a magazine that not only published the competitions but also featured their photographs. The magazine was successful and was later taken over by Pete Sparks. Though cleverly crafted and information packed, the magazine, whose title was changed by Sparks to Your Friend and Mine, was certainly counterproductive to the arena dog's activity because it focused the public's attention more appropriately, I should say that it attracted the attention of the humanists, and they used it as a red flag to throw in the face of their constituents. Soon the arena dog conventions were broken by various agencies on a regular basis. For a while, Cuba was the perfect place for the conventions, but Castro's tenure ended that. Arena dog breeders learned to be a little more secretive about their activities. Either way, the magazine went on, and so did the public pressure. In the early 1970s Your Friend and Mine ceased publication, but other magazines took their place. For this reason, public pressure continued and in the late 70s, the mindless proliferation of intentional crime laws began across the country. During all this time, the breed has gained unprecedented popularity among the general public. The reasons probably varied. One was that since controlled laws came into existence across the country, pit bulls were no longer a special problem as a pet dog. Another was the reaction of the general public to the increase in residential burglaries. Many citizens have obtained guard dogs, and the pit bull has always had a good reputation as a staunch guard dog, despite the fact that they don't bark much and are fond of people, even strangers. If nothing else, your appearance is an impediment anyway. I think, however, that even the sweetest of pit bulls wouldn't stand still if their owner was physically attacked, and I can't think of any other breed I would want by my side. Finally, 
All the publicity generated about the dogs by humanists may have resulted in funds for their coffers, but it also engendered interest in the breed, and as always in the wrong person for the wrong reasons. With this huge contingent of people-loving pit bull breeders, organizations began to form. One of the first was the Golden State Pit Bull Club in Southern California. In 1975, they asked the United Kennel Club to sponsor a pit bull terrier show. When this agency objected, the group approached the American Dog Breeders Association, and they agreed to sanction conformation shows. First, a standard was needed, and the ADBA set one up in a very organized way, looking at photographs of dogs known to be good ring dogs and analyzing them carefully. Other aspects, such as strong bite and intelligence, were not considered because there were no compliance aspects to these quirks. However, these shows became very popular and now the American Dog Breeders Association has chapters across the country. While most of the participants are merely interested in the conformation, it has been fun to see the arena dog breeder also take part in it and get involved with them. Recently, weight pullers, like sled dogs, have become a popular component of conformation competitions, and many bulldogs have broken the record for sled pullers. Some may worry that exposures will lead to the deterioration of the breed. Are today's competitors following the same path that staff's creators followed many years ago? Well, there is a definite difference in attitudes today. Devotees of the original staff, just as today's competitors are, were an amalgamation of pit breeders, reformed, or retired, pit breeders, and just plain breed breeders. In any case, the course of action was entirely different. It was decided, in part by pressure from the American Kennel Club, to completely disapprove of dog fighting and to speak loudly and persistently about it. All of this was designed to increase the public's acceptance of the breed and to throw off the superstition of staff devotees. No goals were reached. Even today the public swallows the creators of staff where the pit breeders, why else would they want the dogs? and the underhanded staff breeders approach the breed never did much to promote it. Today's American Dog Breeders Association shows dog enthusiasts reciprocally respect a good hunting dog. They are fascinated by the history of the pit dog and would not even consider breeding a dog simply because it has good conformation. Rather, their interests are in perpetuating the essence of the race, not just one's fellow man. In hands like these, the race is well served. Some crazy politician in San Francisco wants to ban the race. Before the proposal comes before the Board of Supervisors, these people have mobilized the opposition to include even the human maniacs. Enact an anti-race law in Hollywood, Florida. That's fine but be prepared to be booked into a civil lawsuit by these people in which they've ordered a battalion of connoisseurs, some of them biologists and doctors who own pit bulls. Although these things are an expensive undertaking, they serve as warnings to other demagogues who panic the public and, pandering to votes, come up with various discriminatory laws against the American pit bull terrier breed. They will, however, be held responsible in the final analysis for the unnecessary expense they allege on their constituents for arbitrary and idle minds pushing for discriminatory, and thus unconstitutional, legislation. I have referred to these last few years as the era in which American pit bull terrier breeders were put to the test. While these were difficult and discouraging times, it was also one of the less serious unions among devoted owners. The breed will likely be better off for it. One of the beneficial effects I've noticed is that it has what was called before natural enemies working together. So pit dog breeders, ADBA people, UKC people, staff breeders, Stafford breeders, 
and even bull terrier breeders are working side by side on certain projects, truly a sight to warm the valve of an old cynical heart. I think medicine is worse than illness. Beaumont and Fletcher That was part two of the audiobook, The World of the American Pit Bull Terrier. My name is Rodolfo Luiz, and I invite everyone to enjoy the knowledge of this wonderful breed. Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. God bless you all. I went.